Hello, and welcome to Designing Music Now's review of Output's Signal. My name is Dale Crowley, and today I will be speaking with Greg Lehrman, the CEO of Output. Greg is a composer, producer, and technologist at the forefront of the music industry. Always pushing to create something new and unique, Lehrman's work can be heard in the Smithsonian simultaneously at The Daily Show and Saturday Night Live. His scores are found in feature films, network shows, and the biggest campaigns worldwide, including Avatar, Inglorious Bastards, The Avengers, and 127 Days. Beyond writing, his meticulously crafted sounds for Apple, Reason, and his own brand, Output, have provided the inspiration for a new generation of music makers. Greg is also the CEO of Output, creator of three amazing virtual instruments, Rev, Exhale, and Signal, which we're going to be talking about today. But before we dive into Signal, could you please tell me a bit more about your background and how you got started scoring for film, TV, and video games? Pleasure to be here. Nice to meet you, of course. Um, <clears throat> well, my background was primarily uh, you know, scoring films and TV shows and that sort of thing. So uh, I came at it from a, a, comp uh, a composer standpoint, but um, also background and, and, you know, record production and, um, you know, producing bands and things like that. So I had, uh, well, I got my start in LA about 12 years ago. I was uh, an assistant over at Remote Control, which is uh, Hans Zimmer's company. And then I went from there and I worked for, a few different composers. I, I worked and apprenticed under Jeff Rona for uh, at least four years and then went from there to working in-house over at BMG Publishing, which became Universal Publishing, and um, oversaw production for uh, various libraries. And so, you know, between all of that and, you know, m then my own life as a composer, um, I had been just staying pretty busy scoring whatever I can get my hands on. And so, you know, I went on my own about six or seven years ago and just been busy scoring films and TV shows and uh, trailers and really anything they'll hire me to do. And you've worked on some really amazing projects for Hans Zimmer. You worked with uh, with him on The Last Samurai. And then also you've worked on some other great uh, films. Uh, you're doing one right now with uh, with Robert Redford. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah, it's this. It's a it's a TV show. Um, I, I'm not allowed, yeah I'm not allowed to say much just because they uh, I'm on a contract. But um, it's very cool to be on a on a show with Redford. You know, it's uh, as a child I was a huge fan along with my brother uh, of the movie The Natural, and you know, literally we watched it all the time. So you know, I it it this show just got started a, a, about a month ago. So. Um, it should be out maybe in six months, and, and that's when I can talk about it. But it's it's pretty cool. Well, great. And some of the other things that you've done as far as trailers, uh, you did the trailer for Maleficent. How was that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was great. You know, the the trailer thing is an interesting, it's an interesting world because they are often, you know, they're, they're making the trailer before they finish the film itself. So, you know, and often you're working on this trailer a, a year in advance, and that's the first time they get into discussions of, you know, um, what the musical tone is going to be. In fact, often if I'm hired to work on a trailer, it's before a composer's ever hired. Right. So to, to score the film. So, you know, sometimes you're working on it and it's, it's, you know, you're doing original music and other times they just license pre-existing music that you've written. Uh, but either way, the trailer is, it, it's, it's a fun time. It's, uh, it's fun to help sculpt the direction of the product or, you know, of the final film. So. And you've worked on some video game. I, was it trailers for Call of Duty and League of Legends, or did you actually do some in-game music for that as well? Uh, yeah, Call of Duty was a trailer for League of Legends. You know, that one's funny. I I wrote a piece of music that is uh, um, it's published by Universal, and so they licensed it into League of Legends as one of the it's one of the main themes of the game. And I had no idea. All of a sudden, one day I did a Google search of my own name, and and there was like you know. Somebody had taken this video and put it together and it was like, you know, League of Legends music and, you know, it had six or seven hundred thousand hits. And and then I heard it live. At, uh, they were playing it at the Staples Center when they did the whole League of Legends live. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy, but um, it's kind of taken off from there. So that was that was pretty cool. That's fantastic. Have you worked on any other video game projects? No, not so much. Um, not really, I, I'd like to work on more. I, most of my you know, 
a lot of this comes down to just your relationships and people that you've worked with in the past. And so a lot of them are, you know, more directors in the film and TV world. So, uh, but I, I, yeah, I'd be open to, to whatever. Very cool. And just one other question, going back a little bit further, what is your musical training? And uh, I also saw that you graduated from Cornell. What was your degree from Cornell? I started, I was a, I was a clarinet player as a kid. Wow. Not the, you know, it's interesting. Um, but I was a clarinet player and I played in an orchestra up until I was about maybe 11 or 12 years old. And at that point I took up the guitar and because for a 12 year old, you know, Guns N' Roses was cooler than uh, Benny Goodman. <laughs> but, so I switched over to guitar and kind of left the uh, orchestral roots behind. And I played guitar up through college. And then in school, I was, you know, you, you learn a, a lot of different instruments, <clears throat> you know, well enough to write for them. But, you know, not necessarily well enough to be a performer by any means. So, um you know, I, I, I play drums poorly and I play the piano poorly and I, I, you know, I play a little bit of a lot of things not so well, but that's, that's my background. My degree, um, I actually had a double degree. Uh, I graduated with, um, uh, it was a business degree and music theory degree. Your first gig or your first big break in the industry was with Hans Zimmer. How did that come about? Well, uh, <clears throat> it was actually, it was through, I used to, I was, subscribe to this thing called the film music network uh job post and they would send out emails when a job would come available and so they sent out this email that just said it said you know um position available with huge composer and i remember <laughs> it had no more information than that but i was able to track down that the link referred to remote control and i looked up remote control i lived in new york at the time and so i was able to track it back and then I found the phone number for remote control and asked if they were hiring. And they said, oh, yeah, we actually are. So I convinced the secretary there, the receptionist, that if I sent her my resume, which was filled with absolutely nothing because I had just graduated school, uh, would she put it on you know, the appropriate desk? And she did that. And so all the other resumes went to the Film Music Network and mine went directly to Hans's team. And so I got a phone call. I think it was the next day. And it was probably about... Uh, 11 o'clock at night, maybe eight o'clock here in Los Angeles. And they said, you know, we were impressed that you got us this, uh, this resume. If you're interested, you know, you need to come on down because we're interviewing. And I said, Oh, I, I could be there in a week. No problem. <laughs> and they said, no, well, we'll either see you tomorrow or we won't. And so I, I went to the airport at about five in the morning, found a flight, jumped on a plane. Uh, and I was given the, the job sort of right then and there as a trial period. So uh, it was interesting. I had to sleep on a couch for a few months till I got my bearings. <laughs> wow. But I feel like in Los Angeles, you know, in this industry, you, you kind of have to do those things to get work. You know, you have to you have to show up at people's doors or do the unthinkable to get a job because everybody wants the same jobs. Well, that is an amazing story. Now let's talk about Output and uh, how that uh, got started. Uh, output was... You know, it's kind of blossomed into this thing, but it never, the intention was never for it to be a company. Um, in my own writing and my own production, I tend to, um, I tend to like to experiment a lot and tweak things. And um, I was looking for a product for myself because the, the first product we came out with was, was Rev, and it was all about things in reverse. And I had been looking for an instrument or a synthesizer that played things in reverse for a long time. In fact, I kept asking friends of mine to make them. <laughs> I just wanted it for myself. And so I felt like it would, it would save me so much time because, you know, just, just as part of a sound design trick, I would take melodies and I would double them with reverse elements and kind of blend them in the background. And, um, you know, even how like a, if you ever watch a painter, they'll start with, they'll take their canvas and they'll, they'll kind of just, you know, throw different colors and smear it in the background. And, yeah. and from that, you have something to start painting on top. I would use reverse textures in that same kind of way. So uh, I brought on, so I started working on it, had the idea and the sketches of what I was thinking. And then I brought on a, a person who was really good at contact and we started working on it. And then you know, within four or five months, we realized how uh, how much harder it was than we thought it was going to be. And so what ended up 
you know, we thought it would be a couple months of work and, you know, not much money. Um, we ended up spending two years on it wow. and, you know, a ton of money in development and sound design and hiring people and, and, you know, just trying to get really good producers and composers to play with it and trying to make it something that we were really proud of. And once we had gone that far, we realized, okay, well, we actually have to sell this thing. So, um, so output was born about two years ago, uh, actually as of November. So we were, we just passed the two year mark. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when we launched output at that point, we hadn't even incorporated our company because, uh, we didn't know if we would sell five copies or, or we had no idea. We just figured, Hey, let's, let's put this thing out. So it's, uh, it's been, it's been a great ride since then. You know, we're now, uh, up to 13 full-time employees here and we, uh, uh, we put out our fourth product this year and we have some exciting things to come. So that's fantastic. Congratulations on all your success. And you know, the products that you've put out are just amazing. I mean, playing with signal, it, it's like having a, a whole new a palette of instruments to play with, a whole new palette of rhythms, a whole, it's, it's really breaking new ground. It's ultra modern and ultra cool. Um, so what was your inspiration for Signal? Well, Signal was, you know, it's funny when you deliver stems on a film or a TV show or sort of anything that we're working on, there's always, uh, you know, you have the bass stem, you have the drum stem, you have the, maybe this it, strings and pads. I always have a pulse stem. There's mm -hmm. almost always a pulse in whatever uh, we work on. And so it was this thing where, you know, I need to build it on almost every track. And yet there was no easy place to go to build one. You know, I can go to a synthesizer and I can, I can do it that way, or I could start cutting up audio in a cool way. But there was never a product that was, you know, really singularly developed for um, building and manipulating a pulse. And what got us really excited was the thought of being able to take all the different ways of doing it and combining it under one engine. So from arpeggiators to step sequencers to LFOs to even what we have, the, the, the tape looper, um, it's just all the different ways that we would be doing it. And now you've combined it so that one sound can be accessing a tape loop while it's also accessing an arpeggiator. And by putting it across, not just, you know, two layers with two rhythms, but actually four rhythms, um, you get some pretty, you get some complexity, but you also get subtle motion. You know, you can have an eighth note going and it's, and it's a real intense rhythm, but on top of that, you can have an LFO uh, moving across two bars that's just slowly moving across your pan so that now you're getting a little bit of that movement and it's an, it's a, it's very subtle but I think it's it's quite effective so that was really the that was the point and to do that in the past you'd have to make multiple passes you'd have to you know do basic you know record it three or four times in order to get any similar type of effect whereas now it can be you can actually perform it and have all of these multi polyrhythms going it is really tremendous, super easy to learn, but super deep in its programming. And so did it start as something fairly simple and then the complexity built over time? Or how did yeah. that come about? Yeah, it, it always does. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when we start a product, we put together the wish list of what we want. And then, you know, we'll prototype it in Reactor or with, you know, internal code or, or contact instruments, whatever we can do to try to get an idea of what it's going to be. Um, and as we do it, there's, you know, the requests just start adding up. Well, wouldn't it be cool if it did X and right. Y and Z before you know it, it, it's this, it's this beast of complexity. And now we're worried that nobody will understand it. So our, the mantra here is always to, to build something that is genuinely clean and simple and easy to understand. You don't have to read a manual. You could sit down and use it right away. However, we do have a lot of, uh, customers who love to tweak. And so we never, you know, we always want to give them the opportunity to be able to jump in and have access to every button imaginable. We don't want to make all the decisions for them. So in Signal, you know, you'll see a front page that's it's pretty easy. You can pull up presets. You can, you know, you have macros, um, which really give you access to control a lot of things that will transform the sound quickly. Uh, so you could dial it in and make it your own. 
without having to go into very advanced um, you know, back end. But if you want that, you click on the advanced page and you have access to everything. And if you want to even go into macro assignability, you, you have the macro mode. So you, you have you have the deep, you know, the, the deep end, and then you have the simple upfront part. So it, it's, I think it's it's hopefully intuitive for people. Yeah, it's like having a Ferrari that you can mod. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can exactly. open the hood and get in there if you know what you're doing. And boy, the the number of tweaks that you can you know, add to this, I, I have just gotten lost, you know, starting with a single patch and then going into the advanced mode and, you know, tweaking all of the uh, pitch LFOs or the ADSR for pitch, ADSR for volume. I mean, and then all of the effects that you have, you've got compression, lo-fi, tape, tape saturation, drive, spread, delay, flutter. I mean, it is, you can do anything with this. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh. I wish I had more time to play with it at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, that's going to be my Christmas, I tell you. <laughs> yeah. Keep, keep de delving into this. I have really enjoyed it. But let's go to the source, and that is the 40 gigabytes of samples. So you've got real natural instruments plus synthesizers. What types of instruments did you sample? When it comes to a pulse, you know, we all know how to pulse a synthesizer, right? That's something that we've all, we, we're comfortable doing. You open up a synth, and you can make a, a pulse sound out of it. What was powerful was the idea of making pulse sounds with organic instruments as well. Right. You know, and and in the end, the sounds that were most unique and most interesting from our sound design team really synthesized. It was, it was the combination of both synthetic sounds and organic sounds and how we manipulated it. So the sources, oh, uh, we have a wide range. I mean, I'd have to open it up to see, but, you know, we went and did... Um, upright bass and we did harp and we did harp harmonics uh you know we did some string instruments we did um you know things like uh, mallet type percussion um happy drum you know all, all anything that would sound that would resonate well and that has a nice attack you know if something doesn't have a nice attack it's hard for it to have a, a good pulse right so uh certainly lots of you know piano and things like that. But then we also went and, um, you know, we sampled lots of synths and also in our synth sampling, we went and actually battened those sounds by combining lots of synths. So when you're going into a source, you know, and you have this ginormous, you know, poly synth sound, it's because we've gone in and sampled eight different synths, detuned them, uh, made a, a giant wall of sound. So it's, uh, it, it can get pretty big or it could be pretty clean and organic. It just depends on what you're going for. Well, it just sounds incredible. Um, let's talk about the rhythm engine, which is the wave, step, arp, and loop. Each one of those are individual things that you can apply to each pulse. Well, first of all, you have two different sound sources, right? You can, that you can, I guess, merge together. And then on top of that, each sound source has two different rhythms that you can then morph between one and another, typically using the, um, the macros and you know that that's pretty awesome so each and then drilling out down into that each one of the rhythm engines could be either a wave which is like an lfo right um it can be a step sequencer which uh, you can set the number of steps and you have a lot of great presets in there it had you can do an arpeggio setting in there or a loop um can you talk about the rhythm engine and how that came about yeah sure uh, at, you know, just like I was saying before, it's really about bringing in the different forms of pulse making. We sat there and, and had a, you know, we have a, a giant wa like whiteboard and we said, okay, how are all the ways that we can think of to make a pulse? And so, you know, an LFO step sequencer, those were kind of a given, uh, an arpeggiator we knew we wanted to include, um, the, the, the tape loop was quite unique because the way we, we look at it, it's almost like you know, performing it like, like somebody would play an MPC, you know, you can play that loop over and over. So you're just, you're taking almost a phrase and it's, it's re-triggering it. And so when you start putting them into the engine, only some of them can be a primary source of modulation versus the secondary source. And what I mean by that is an arpeggiator has to come first in the chain. You're not going to put an arpeggiator later on in the chain. Mm -hmm. So if you look, there's two rhythms per layer and you have four options for that first rhythm you can use the arpeggiator, the, the step sequencer, the LFO, or the tape. Uh, after that, you know, you're putting it through whatever modulation you want. You have your rhythm, and that secondary modulation, 
you're not going to be able to do a secondary with the tape loop because that was the source of the material to begin with. Also, same thing with an arpeggio. So for the secondary modulation, uh, you have the LFO and the step sequencer. But again, it allows you to, to have uh, subtlety, but also more complex rhythms. And then when you have a second layer on top of that, now you have a total of four rhythms going on. And that doesn't mean that you have to have, you know, a very diverse and complex rhythm. You can take all that to make one really clean fat rhythm, or you can have, you know, a primary one with just some subtlety in the, in the background. So that's, uh, that's pretty much how it came about. Right. And when you talk about all the, the different rhythms, you can actually have, you know, triplets, like 160 up to 164th triplets going against quarter note or half note rhythms on the uh, other side. And it just blows my mind. I mean, it really is something I have never even heard before. These are rhythms that probably nowhere else have existed. <laughs> and there's a lot of fun, really exciting. Yeah, you, you, you can get lost pretty quickly. <laughs> um, so what? let's talk about the looper real quick in a little bit more detail. I really had a lot of fun with that because it, it, these are all tempo synced. So if you're doing an 80 beats per minute, and let's say you want to uh, have a song that has multiple tempos, then it will lockstep to each one of those. And so if you have an 80 beats per second with the looper and you're doing quarter note loops, it's fairly, you know, boom, boom, boom. But if you do a, a you know, a 16th or a 32nd, it's boom, 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 boom. So it really uh, allows for that uh, pulsing to, you know, resonate with whatever tempo you're in in a really cool way. You know, if, it's funny. If I had Signal in front of me, I, I could show you a few things. But um, a, great, a great way to play with that as well is you can move the sample start. So you can actually move where that loop starts and you can you can go and find some really interesting parts that you would never expect. You know, it's a uh, it is what you expect in the beginning with the standard attack, but jumping in the middle and manipulating the ADSR and you, you can really come up with some creative tape loops. So it's a uh, it's, it's a it's a fun toy to play with. And what's also cool is you can actually um, turn off the pulse engine and just play with some of the sources as well, oh, yeah. which are really yeah. fun. And especially when you start putting the effects on them, the drive mm -hmm. on some of the guitar loops and so on. So yeah, it's really amazing. Um, just sort of to wrap up here a little bit, do you have any favorite patches? From the sure we do. Uh, <laughs> probably you know I would say numbers one through uh, fifty. <laughs> <laughs> and what we do. As we're finishing a product, we uh, a number of us here will put together our favorite patches, and we just put together a list, and we sort it by popularity. So the most popular patch goes to the top, and so when it comes to our products, you can usually find our favorites right smack up top. Also at the very very bottom, there's also a lot of diversity here in terms of the people that work here. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got composers, record producers. There's two DJs that are here. You've got people in bands. Um, mm -hmm. Really, they come from all different walks of the music industry. And so, you know, what's nice about that is it's not just, hey, this is my taste and these are my favorite presets. It's, you know, different people have different interests and therefore there's there's diversity and variety in, in what we try to present to people. Yeah, and I found that too. I've written a battle cue with this, mm -hmm. uh, with, with Signal, and it has so many great intense bases and the pulsing is like a, you know, it, it, it takes a dubstep to the next level. <laughs> I mean, and, and it goes beyond it because dubstep is very grungy and this is very organic and sounds awesome. But then it also, you have a lot of sort of airy, fairy, sunlight, uh, the one called sunlight loops or at first sight, which are very mm -hmm. nice for like walking through the forest, you know, <laughs> sort of uh, ambient loops. So it really yeah, covers absolutely. everything. Well, we want to hear that. We want to hear the track. Okay, <laughs> I'll put it up for Send sure. Here is the browser. That's one of the things that's really a special feature of, uh, mm -hmm. of Signal, which allows you to quickly and intuitively find stuff that you're looking for. So right. um, you have, you know, it's based on feel like warmth, or um, you can then get arpeggiated stuff or pluck, and you can pick from all of those things, and it, it will sort of sort through that. Uh, do you want to talk about how that came about? Uh, absolutely. The, you know, most contact instruments they're actually unique uh, NKAs per, you know, per preset. And that drove me crazy because I, I wanted everything to be self-contained. So first of all, you know, whether it was Rev or Signal or Exhale, whatever the, the product is, um, we always make it pretty much one unique engine. Uh, 
mm -hmm. uh, or two engines, but it's not like there's hundreds of presets that you are dragging and dropping. So once you open, once you open it up, it's kind of self-contained. Right. The browser itself, it, we wanted something that got you to the final preset that you were looking for. And I think it's something that we, we did a pretty good job on, but we're still trying to get better and better at it. It's how do you, uh, how do you click tags and get where you want to go and find that track? Because I think, you know, none of us want to spend half a day just sitting there cycling through presets. No. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's not fun, but yet it's, it's the reality of what we do. And so uh, we wanted a tagging system. We wanted it to be based on kind of more musical terms. Um, and there weren't many companies that were doing that within the contact framework just because it was a little harder to do it, you know. So um, we, we, we tried our best, and hopefully you guys are able to get where you want to go, you know, sooner than later. Well, I found it incredibly useful, and the patches that came up were apropos completely to what the, what emotions I was trying to score. So, good work. <laughs> good, good. That's good. Well, Greg, thank you very much for taking the time today to talk to us and uh, talk more about Signal. And um, maybe one final question: What's the future like? What other? Uh, I know you've got a new product out, a vocal product. Uh, what else uh, do you have coming up? Uh, there's a lot of products we're working on, but um, can't give specifics, but we have some some fun new toys in the works and, you know, we're, we're building and growing. We're moving into a new space this this coming summer. So um, we've outgrown our, our current facilities. And so, you know, building out the, the studio and the recording studio and um, just everything that will get, we're moving to downtown Los Angeles. So mm. um that will that will take a bit of work to to make that happen, but it's it's a it'll be a really cool and creative and very environmentally friendly space, and we're right by a train, and people, you know, we're gonna have bikes for all the employees now, and uh, you know, try to have some like living walls with plants everywhere, and we're gonna try nice. to you know, compost and recycle, and it, it'll be pretty cool. So we're moving to that space in the summer. Um, until then, we're we're cranking along here. Well, congratulations on all your success, both your personal success with your film and uh, TV scoring, and also with output. Uh, just really thrilled to be able to talk to you today. Yeah, I appreciate it. I love what you're working on. So you take care. Yeah.